All right. Well, Ian had me uh, planning on doing an app review. And then about 45 minutes ago, he goes, hey, why don't you do this other presentation that you've never done before? So I'm going to do it. And um, I'm going to go very fast. And you're going to have a lot of questions. And what I suggest is if I say something that is interesting, write it down. And uh, at the end, we could do a little question and answer. This, uh, this is targeted at two different people, two different types of people, people that hate flat earth and think they have a bunch of reasons that Flat Earth isn't real, and people that know Flat Earth that need to just get their arguments a little bit better. So here we go. You guys up for this? It's going to be a solid hour. It's going to go by fast, I think, because you're going to learn a lot, hopefully. So um, as it says right here, ignorance is no excuse for denying reality. And um, you know, a lot of people say, uh, the, and I said it when I first learned about Flat Earth, Flat Earth is a CIA-developed PSYOP created to discredit all of the truth movement. I actually believed that before I ever looked into it because it just made sense. Flat Earth you know, is really stupid. You know, and if I don't answer one of your questions in this short presentation, it does not make the Earth a globe. It just means that I didn't answer it. And I recommend that you come to my uh, other seminar, which will be the question and answer after this. Um, so there we go. Um, the shape of the Earth does not matter because flat is not a shape. So, you know, is it flat? Is it a spinning globe? Uh, that, that, that's the question. And the, the question is, you know, where are we in this creation? So there's, what do these three things have in common? Does anyone know? They're all loads of crap. None of them are real. They want you to, they want you to think that, uh, that, you know, all of this stuff is real and it's all a bunch of nonsense. So what is flat earth? Uh, well, we're going to get into it. Is this flat earth as I just showed you? Absolutely not. Not flat earth. If you Google flat earth, this is what will show up. Um, this is flat earth. This is a balloon at 120,000 feet looking down at the earth. That light in the distance is uh, not 93 million miles away. It's right there over that part of the earth, as you can see it as a hot spot. Um, and the earth is not spinning a thousand miles an hour and moving in, you know, for three other directions at speeds that you can't even comprehend. It is stationary, and we are just floating above it. Uh, this is what they want. They teach you in school that the sun is the center of our solar system, that we're orbiting around it. But they fail to mention, if you look at it from the side, the sun is flying at a half a million miles per hour. And somehow all of these planets stay in a perfect flat plane of each other, chasing the sun, and their gravitational pulls of each other never disrupt any orbits. But this is, this is what's going on. <clears throat> and then they, they don't want you to understand the speeds um, that these things are going. Can you guys hear the sound on this? Yeah. All right, awesome. So this is the hypersonic sled track. It's going by at Mach 8.6, 8.6 times the speed of sound, right? That is a speed that is hard. Just watch it. It's hard to comprehend that speed. What if I said, now try to imagine double that speed. Now try to imagine 10 times the speed. Your mind is unable to even comprehend what that means. But if we go out in nature, we see this. Right. You have to believe that this lake is spinning. No, is orbiting the sun 10 times faster than that rocket sled. Right. It's orbiting 10 times faster and it's chasing the sun 100 times faster than what I just showed you. Those numbers literally make your mind shut down and go, well, I can't even understand what that means. Right. This lake is staying still. The waters are contained by the shoreline above it, uh, around it. This is a pool during a uh, decent sized little earthquake, a little tiny shaking of the earth. And this is what it does to a swimming pool, right? And the argument people say is, well, you know, you're going on an airplane, you're flying, you know, you can drink a glass of water. Well, that airplane's flying in a straight linear path over a flat plane. Uh, if the airplane took a turn or sped up or slowed down, you'd feel it. If you're driving in a car 100 miles an hour and you filled the dinner plate with water and that car sped up, slowed down, or took the slightest turn, all of that water would leave the plate. Right? They want you to believe that this is going on. These balloons here, the ones on the sides, are moving a 1,000 miles an hour to follow uh, the Earth below them. The ones at the top and bottom are pirouetting like ballerinas. They're not moving at all. They're just spinning with the pole. And if I put one halfway in between any two of those, that's going at another 45-degree like, angle to one of those, and it's spinning at another speed, maybe 500 miles an hour. Um, here's a little silly video I put together of some balloons. How comes that playing? There we go. Whoops. Well... Let me go back. Go back. Let me go back. Let's see if it plays. Uh, this is. Um, are you still I, there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. So these these are these are this is what you have to believe is going on. Can you, can you hear me? Am I gone? Am I back? 
You guys still moving. It's just like, you got, all right. Am I, am I back? We're back. Yay. Okay. All right. All right. No problem. I'm uh, I'm uh, I'm on an unstable Mexican internet. Uh, and so, so this is what you have to believe is going on with balloons flying all over the earth. But when we go out and we actually see balloons, you know, they want you to deny this. They want you to say, well, you know, the earth, it looks like the earth is still and these balloons are just floating above it. But the earth is spinning a thousand miles an hour, orbiting 66,000 miles an hour and chasing the sun at an incomprehensible speed. But, you know, just ignore what your eyes see and your senses tell you because you can't trust them. You have to trust science. So a lot of people say, well, we've known the earth is flat for 2000 years. Eratosthenes, the Greek... Um, Mathematician supposedly did a um, an experiment with either wells or sticks, but the the experiment's basically the same. Where he said there was no shadow on his stick, and the sun is infinitely far. And uh, his buddy, who walked 500 miles, counted the steps, somehow was able to communicate with him. Said, "Well, I see a shadow, and it's this long." He did some math and figured out the the um, the the diameter of the Earth. So we'll look at that in a second. This is this is just you know another another shot of 120,000 feet. Um, let me just go here. So here is Eratosthenes. Oops. Here's Eratosthenes experiment on the right. He's standing on the lower uh, stick that has no shadow with the parallel sun rays coming in. His buddy 500 miles away. His stick has a shadow. We've all been brainwashed by Carl Sagan and Cosmos and every other show that um, that is the only way that can happen is on a ball with an infinitely far sun. The problem is on a flat earth with a local sun, as you can see on the left. Um, Aristoteles is on the right, his buddy's on the left. You could do the same exact math and figure out the, the, the sphericity of that flat table. Nobody has ever seen uh, rays coming in straight. We see corpuscular rays. You know, look at these rays. It kind of makes the sun look like it's right above the clouds, which makes a lot of globe, uh, globe believers, flat earth haters go, well, the sun can't be up uh, just above the clouds because the sun would be, you know, an airplane would hit. Airplanes go much higher than that. Agreed. But we'll get into that. A little later. This is what uh, what it should look like if um, Eratosthenes had a valid experiment. Sun rays coming in like this. No one's ever seen that because it doesn't exist, right? These uh, these batteries are beer cans on a flat table. Um, if you do the math, uh, Eratosthenes has proven that this flat table is a sphere, which is nonsense. Um, on the left we have Eratosthenes, um, and on the right we have a flat Earth with a local sun. It works on both. It doesn't prove either. Doesn't prove either, um, and, you know. And if you listen to Neil deGrasse Tyson, he says Eratosthenes works, you know, with two. But if you add a third well, it doesn't work. It does work with a third well. And even in Neil's video trying to debunk this, he um, shows it where it does work and just ignores the fact that it does work. So this is uh, in my in my room here. I have a sheet. I have a square light uh, ten feet behind the sheet, and we're both looking at this from two different positions, and we both see the apparent sun in different positions. This is why you can't triangulate the position of the sun because two different people see it in the sky at two different times. I look at the sky, our personal atmospheric dome, as our as our um, personal sun. We see the sun in a different in a different place um, based on our position. So we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, Eratosthenes was wrong because you know, according to this picture, this table is spherical. The other argument people say is on the equinox. The sun sets for the in the east for everybody. Well, here that center line is east. Someone on the equator is looking east can see the sunset. But if we draw a line from all of these other latitudes looking directly east, they're all looking at the equator, right? This is the same on the flat Earth. the The globe is just a representation of the flat Earth wrapped around a globe. It's a two dimensional x y um, coordinate system that they literally wrapped around a ball. If the Earth was a ball, we should have an X, Y, Z, longitude, latitude, and height, I guess. Um, but we don't have X and Y because the Earth is flat. That, that's just the bottom line. Um, let me go here. Oops. So we'll talk about sunsets now. How does the sunset below? This is one that gets everybody. It's about what is the horizon. So right here, you know, people say this is proof of the globe. The sun is coming up from below a physical curve on a ball, right? Sure, it's hard to argue that one if you don't understand um, what is going on. Your, your, your pictures are flicking out, but I hope you guys can see me all right. Um, so the sun just moves away. And think about this. The sun moves away, and as it moves away, it gets lower in the sky. Now, that low cloud there, as you can see, as the sun moves away, it's going to disappear from the bottom up beyond that cloud. Okay? You guys can still hear and see me, yeah? yeah. Okay. So the sun's going to move away, but 
as you move those clouds, the atmosphere into the distance, it all compresses into a tighter line that we call the horizon. Clutter to say the horizon rises to eye level, um, but I have changed that. The horizon is thousands and thousands and thousands of feet above your eye level. We'll get into that in a, in a moment. So that sun right there, as it moves away, is going to disappear from the bottom up. You can't tell um, if, if it was a little farther away. That line, which is the clouds, the sun's above the clouds, is thousands and thousands of feet above you, but it looks like it's at your eye level. Here is um, a sun that looks like it's setting, but if we zoom in, we can see that it's really not setting. You just can't see that space between the sun and the apparent horizon. So here is a building. We're looking straight up, and let's say it's noon at the beginning of that. And then it's like, let's say it's approaching one o'clock. Now it's one o'clock. Now you know that that sun is not below the horizon. It's just beyond the building. Remember that, beyond the building. Now there's two ways you can see the sun again. You can climb up, now get a balloon, float up and look over the building. Or you can walk backwards a couple hundred yards or maybe you know, a couple miles. And um, the sun will, you'll be able to see the sun because you have a better angle at it. So here is a perspective grid. So this guy standing here, his eye line is that line right there. And this is just how we see the sky moves down, the land ramps up and the sides ramp in. This is how we see. They don't teach us this anymore. So if I throw a mountain in here, what you can say about the top of this mountain is that mountain is thousands of feet above his eye line. Cool. So again, we bring the sun up and the sun, we, whoops, here it goes. The sun is moving away and it's going beyond the mountain beyond the mountain. So if I move backwards and I make the mountain smaller, um, let me keep going here and let me just fill it in. Boom, boom, and boom. All right. So, so what can we say? Now we can see the, the sun again. It, it's just beyond the, it was beyond the mountain because we we're standing right next to it. Now that we're way back, we can see it again. So that horizon line, the top of that mountain there, that's at his eye level. What can we say about it? Is it at his eye level or is it thousands of feet above his eye level? Like it was before. It's thousands of feet above his eye level. So if we add, um, if we let the sun go farther away, what's it doing? Is it going below the horizon or just beyond the mountain, which is thousands of feet above his eye level? Um, my thing just glitched out. Where is the rest of it? Come on. Okay. So if I add the the sky, the the atmosphere, the clouds, and we move the sun, the sun is now above the clouds. You all know that. It's above the clouds, and as it moves away, as it moves away, it's going to go, again, beyond that horizontal eye zone known as the horizon. So what can we say? Is that cloud below? Nope, it's beyond. Is that line we see? That line we see is the top of the mountains. It's also where the clouds are merging into that same line. So we see the clouds, which are thousands of feet above the mountain, all at eye level. So the sun is just above it. It's gone beyond it, and that's why you can't see it. Here's an example. Here's a, a, a crude, crude graphics here, but we're looking. The sun is beyond these buildings. It kind of, you know, it's hard to see, but if I, if I move backwards and, this, and those buildings get smaller and smaller, look, I can see the sun again. And then as the sun continues its journey away, it just goes beyond, beyond what appears to be at eye level. Here is the moon moving across our sky, and this is how we see it. Perspective makes it look down. But there's two different types of perspective, terrestrial ground perspective or celestial uh, sky pers perspective. Top left, we're looking at that same line from a terrestrial point of view. On the bottom right, we're looking at that line from a celestial elevated point of view, and it's a level line. But from the one on the terrestrial one, sure looks like it's going down. It's just going away. It's going, it looks like it's going behind that cardboard mountain I have there. And on the top, you see the sun doing the same thing, going beyond, beyond what I call the atmospheric deck of opacity. So when we, people say, well, why can't you see Polaris you know, uh, from the south? Well, the answer, the answer is it's too far and it's merged into the horizon. So the gray layer is the atmosphere. And when we look up, we're looking through just a thin layer of atmosphere. So when we're looking at the stars in the sky, we're looking through a thin layer of atmosphere. But when we look across the land, we're looking through all atmosphere. It's like trying to look through uh, an Olympic swimming pool from one end to the other. Um, you can't see the other end on a big pool, even if the water's clear, just because it becomes opaque over distance. But this is called an orthographic view. Nobody ever sees anything in an orthographic view. This is just an illustration of what it would look like. This is what it really looks like. The ground ramps up, the sky ramps down, and everything wedges into that horizontal eye zone. So 
One of the things that um, the Globers like to say is, well, if the sun was 3,000 miles above the earth, it would never set. I don't know if that's true, but um, I don't agree with the 3,000 miles. That's just one distance. If the sun was half the size they say it is, then it could be 1,500 miles above. And if it was a quarter of the size, it could be 750 miles above. I personally think the sun is maybe 25 miles above us, but that's a whole nother show to talk about. Um, so this line uh, represents the sun at 3,000 miles. And if we say, all right, we'll go 3,000 miles away across the flat earth, um, and we put the sun up, uh, we just draw a line here, we can do some geometry and say, all right, we can figure out, um, you know, these angles. And then if we draw, if we say, okay, we'll put another sun at 6,000 miles away, that's like from New York to to Hawaii or something like that. Um, the, the, the third sun would be in Hawaii. If you, do, if you add the lines, um, the first one's at a 45 degree angle and the other one is at a 22 and a half degree angle. Um, and it wouldn't set. But again, as I said earlier, this is an orthographic view. Nobody ever sees that. This is how we really see. The perspective would bring the sun down and it would literally go beyond the atmosphere, looking all through the atmosphere, and it would go behind it. That atmosphere creates a horizon that is thousands and thousands and thousands of feet above your eyeline, but it looks like it's at your eyeline. Here is a, um, a sunset I filmed from my drone, super cold day. My friends that were down at the beach on the bottom right in that black area, they saw the sunset 10 minutes ago. I'm still filming it and it's going away and it's going away and it's going away and it faded out into the perfectly clear sky. This can only be filmed on a super clear day with low humidity and cold that mostly keeps the humidity away. But the sun just goes away and it takes its light with it. We're trained to think that light travels for billions and billions and billions of years, um, but it's not. Here is um, here is the what's going on here. This is just the sun. Now, is the camera diving forward faster than the speed of sound on a ball, or is the sun, whatever it is, just approaching the camera across the sky and rising due to perspective? Right. You have to believe that the sun is staying still and that the camera is diving forward twice the speed of a jetliner, which is absolute insanity. Now, this is one perspective. That's this terrestrial perspective. Things get smaller. This is the sun going away. It's a side view on the right. So if we had this train car all the way at the top, it's already small and it gets smaller I mean, it gets about the same size. So this these two balls here. They look one. The one in the distance looks tiny. It's seven feet away. Now I raise this thing up, and look, they ball. I'm not getting any closer to the second ball. It, it's about the same size, and that's exactly how we see the sun. You know, Globers say, you know, when the when the sun sets, you know, on a flat Earth, it should get smaller and smaller and smaller. No, because it's already reduced in size because it's above you, and as it moves away, it goes down, and as it goes down into the thicker and thicker and thicker atmosphere. That atmosphere actually magnifies it, um, and and it creates a, a a magnification. So, going on here, all right. And um, if you listen to the Beatles, is that sun going away? Or are you falling over backwards twice the speed of sound? Um, I think the answer is quite obvious. Here's a um, here's a, a shot of the moon in Alaska when the moon is over um, on its innermost loop over the Tropic of Cancer, and it's just it's cut up a little bit. It's low resolution, but what is going on here? Is the moon traveling across the Earth? You know, I'm just going forward and backwards here, or, or is the camera falling forward or backwards depending on which way we're looking? If you look, I'll show you the map again in a second. Maybe I'm in the way. Um, it's just circling around and it's close to Alaska. So we see it for a really long time. I'm just flicking it back and forth here. Are we moving or is the light in the sky moving? The light in the sky is moving. Curvature. They say that we're just an amoeba on a basketball. We can't see curvature because an amoeba would think that the basketball is flat. Well, they, but they want us to believe that we can see ships over the horizon, but we can't see the, the horizon. We can't see the curvature from 120,000 feet. Here is a um, time lapse of Skunk Bay, a non-tidal bay. And if you just watch the beach and the land and the buildings and the mountains, they disappear. This is time lapse over the whole day. 
um, they're, they're, they're disappearing at any point. You take a picture and a global go, look, the building's missing. The bottom of the building's missing. The top of the building's missing. The whole beach is missing. Uh, this is just how the atmosphere plays with magnification and how we see things, right? So this is literally a stationary camera filming through all the thickness of the atmosphere. So you have to understand the atmosphere is um, playing, you know, is, is doing these things. This is just showing you when you look through water, it lowers the horizon, that black line of distance is the horizon. So it lowers it. When we look through the air, um, the air is look is just what is the same as water, just thinner. Um, and it does push things down. So you have to deal with that, but no, um, nobody ever deals with that. So listen to Austin for a second. Must be curving down away from you in all directions. What that means is as you go higher, the earth is going to be further and further away from you because it's going down and away from you and you're now going up. Well, here's what actually happens when we go up in altitude on the earth. You see where the starting line is. You see the horizon. And let's see what happens as we increase altitude. Horizons rising with the drone. You see that as it goes up, the Earth should be dropping because you're seeing farther. And if you're on the top of a ball, the farther out you look, the lower it should be. But it's rising, just like a flat Earth would show. So here's an experiment Rob Skiba did. He's got a, a lens that just magnifies what we're seeing. And as he slides this boat away across a completely level table, um, it disappears. It's on a level table. It's not going below it. And there's no atmosphere we're dealing with here. It's nothing. No waves. This is a perfectly smooth table. And the same thing happens. Now, when you add like waves and water and land features and atmosphere, um, it does it even worse. So the, what, what happened to the bottom of those buildings? From a place of supreme importance to one of complete nihilistic indifference. All right. So... Uh, let me jump here. So this is the Red Bull jump. Uh, everyone remembers that. And they, he supposedly saw a curvature. This is him uh, uh, at the ground and at 127,000 feet. 127,000 feet. You can't even fathom that height. But the the camera in the in the capsule is showing the horizon at the exact same level. And if you ask me, it actually looks a little bit higher when he gets up higher. Um, it, so, but we'll just call it the same level. It's definitely not lower. So you have to believe. You have to understand something. At 127,000 feet, that's uh, the horizon. It, 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 I'm sorry. Um, at 600, and at, uh, at that height, your horizon is 618 miles away. That's how far it would be if the Earth was a globe. That's how far you'd be able to see. The horizon drop um, at 250 is 250,000 feet, right? But that balloon is up at 127,000 feet. So the horizon should be. 381,000 feet below that balloon, but it's still the same levels of when he was 10 feet off the ground. So when people bring up the Red Bull, Red Bull proves the earth is flat, right? So just, uh, I'll, I'll go over that again real quick. 618 miles is how far you should be able to see at that height. On the ground, if you wanted to see something 618 miles away, it would have to be 250,000 feet tall for you to see it because it would be behind that much curvature. Add that to the height of the, the balloon, and uh, it's 381,000 feet. That horizon is 381,000 feet, or it's the Earth is flat. 381,000 feet below you, or the Earth is flat. All right. This one goes out where, um, you know, the, the, they, they love, this was all over the mainstream media. They're like, this is a Fata Magana mirage. This boat is not floating in the air. It just, it's just the boat is below the curvature, and it's floating up. And that's a bunch of hogwash. This is because there's no land in the distance. There's no features in the sky. And the water right past that, what you think is a horizon, is just glassy water versus the light wind ripple on the water. And if I draw in the horizon, that's actually where the horizon is. And that boat is just sitting on perfectly smooth water. There's no horizon. There's no, I mean, there's no mirage. There's no lifting. There's no nothing. It's just people don't understand what they're looking at. If there was some land over on that, uh, on that, um, above that line there, you would see, oh, okay, it's just not a smooth, glassy, reflective part of the lake. This happens all the time. This is the Red Bull jump. Um, thanks to them, uh, uninterrupted feed of a lift, unlike NASA, SpaceX, and the rest of them, where they have seven cuts before it clears the tower. But this thing went up 
I'm speeding it up a little bit for time. And it went up uh, 72 miles and it hit something. And then it stopped spinning. And it floated kind of weird for a second, which is very interesting. And the earth kind of looks flat there. But more importantly, that's the moon. That's the moon right there. Right? So where was the moon when this took off? Right? So the, the sun right there, it shows you where it's noon. We, this took off in Arizona to the left of that. So it was like 11 a.m. when that took off in Arizona. And the moon was over Australia. So if the basketball, if the earth was a basketball, that rocket was a fraction of a millimeter above the basketball and the moon was on the floor directly below the basketball, how would it see it? There's no answer. Mainstream has no answer. They won't even address it because they'd have to say the earth is flat. Right on an Earth, on a ball Earth, we have to have a physical um, curvature at a certain distance. A six foot tall person standing at the edge of calm water should see a physical horizon at three miles and should not be able to see the surface of the water beyond three miles because that's how much it curves six feet in just three miles. Well, here is a long distance shot from the top of a mountain. You know, you can see farther, but using their Earth curve calculator, um, adjusting for the height. Um, all of these mountains that we see here, um, they're over 700 miles away. They're, the tops of those mountains should be over 40 miles below the curve, 40 miles, right? That balloon shot I showed you at the beginning, that was only 20 miles up. Should be twice that amount of curve, twice that amount of curve um, to, to go that, to, to, to see these. They should be behind a physical curve. You know what mainstream says about this? nothing they will not address it because they can't scream refraction because it's just too much they just will not address it they pretend it doesn't exist they pretend that oh it's a lie it's not this it's a cloud we can see um seven or eight mountains there and they all work perfectly as you notice here i'm zooming in on some ships uh that you couldn't see at first because your eyes couldn't resolve them but now we see them and this is a wide amplitude swelly day. So if you watch these boats, they're not going over the curve. They're just going behind swells. Now that swell raises the level of the earth plane, but you can't tell the, dis the difference at that distance and everything looks like it's at your eye level. So people say, oh, that boat's over the curve. No, it's not. It's just behind a swell. It's just behind a swell. You can do this yourself. Get a telescope, binoculars, camera, zoom out, you know, get as low to the ground as you can and you'll see. You'll see that these things, look at that boat on the right there. It's not over a curve. It's just beyond a swell. What about um, a condition where, you know, large bodies of water at rest lie completely flat um, and flat, still uh, unmoving water when it's cold freezes flat. So here is a lake, uh, not a lake, a little, it's a little reservoir, maybe it's a lake. Um, a guy got out there at night, got his camera uh, half a foot off the ground. And he put these laser lights out there at different distances, um, eight miles, seven miles, six miles, and five miles. I don't think they're lasers, they're actually just regular lights, right? The curvature at that distance, and now I added refraction, which is nonsense. I added everything. It should be more like the first one should be like 44 feet or something like that. Um, I, I took it down. I give the globe every benefit of the doubt. The, the one on the left should be 30 feet below a physical curve, 22 feet, 15 feet, and nine feet. But somehow... They all just rise up to the horizon line and pretend that they're all at the same level to trick you that the earth is, um, that the earth is, is a flat plane, just like every sense and every test tells us. So here's another spot in Illusia, France. We're standing on, on Canigou Mountain and we're looking across the ocean. And out there, directly out there, is um, Mount Canigou. Um, and it is, at that distance of 275 miles, the top of Mount Canigou from this viewing position, according to globe mass, should be well over a half a mile below the curve. And guess what? You can't see it. Must be curvature, right? That must be the horizon. Well, the thing is, the sun, as many of you know, migrates in between the two tropics every year. And twice a year, it lines up with Alusia, France and Mount Canigou. And when it lines up, the sun backlights the mountain and all of a sudden you can see it. Now, the mainstream answer is, well, the sun's not really there. It's actually below it, and the mountain's below the curve, but it's all refracting up, stopping at eye level to trick you into thinking the Earth is flat, which is absolutely ridiculous because it works every year, all the time, twice a year for a couple of days where this lineup. The reason you can't see Mount Canigou on the other days is because the light that's bouncing off of Mount Canigou isn't strong enough to push through 275 miles of atmosphere, but the sunlight is, and so it's backlighting it and you're able to see it. That right there is a globe killer. Everything I'm showing you is a globe killer. 
But um, Globies are very difficult to kill because they just don't want to admit anything, right? Official photo from 100,000 feet, NASA official photo, and uh, amateur balloon from 120,000 feet. Someone's lying, not us. Um, again, you know, they want us to believe, um, you know, Earth, Earth is, uh, is, is too big to see the curve, but rockets curve over the Earth, right? That is a rocket that's supposedly curving over the Earth. Give me a break. I mean, we've all seen those airplanes that leave perfectly straight lines in the sky. Um, they're going level with the Earth, and the rocket should be going up. But um, compare those, it's absolutely ridiculous. This is um, circumnavigation. That's another big argument people have. Um, on the flat Earth, north is in the center. If you have your back to the center, no matter what direction you go, you're heading south. If you guys point in any direction, you're pointing south. Every direction is south. No matter where you point, it's south. You may be pointing north, but continue that line past the North Pole, and you're pointing south. So here is my flat earth. I got a magnet in the center. I got a compass, and I'm pushing it west. West is a circle. I'm following the same degree east now, 90 degrees, 90 degrees. I am not turning according to the compass, but I am turning. If I try to dead reckon west, as soon as I start moving, I'm heading south. Look, the compass turns, and I'm heading south. The compass should turn a little more. The magnet's just not strong enough, but I'm heading south. Now, if I go south, I should pop up on the far right side of the screen, but I don't. No one's gone from Santiago and come back to Australia. Now I'm going north, 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 north. Watch the compass. Boom. I'm going south now. It's still a straight line. Every direction is south. You cannot point east or west because you're pointing south. Um, Amelia Earhart, they, they tell us, you know, she proved the Earth is a globe because she went around the world. She either went east or west. Here's her path. Her compass would show that she's going east or west, and uh, she went around. You know, if you if you circumnavigate your neighborhood, it doesn't make it a sphere. And a lot of people say, well, well what about you know when uh, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor? How'd they get there? Just like that, just right there. That's it, right? Because if you look at uh, the globe or your globe memes, you know, globe globe people have to lie to straw man flat Earth, right? Because they show a, um, a Mercator map and they show it like like this. It's so stupid, I can't even repeat it. But if you look on the flat Earth map, Japan's right there at the top. The arrow points to Hawaii. That's how, that's how all of that happened. Um, so this is just this was on the news a couple of years ago. About a solar airplane. They're showing us it's going around the world. They 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 literally are telling us, and that's a whole other argument why why they do that, why they're telling us. Right? This is this is just the sun and the moon circumnavigating the world. They go around the world. Um, let's talk about airplanes. Airplanes. Airplanes fly in the air over the Earth plane, uh, not the curve horizon. They go, you know, they follow the horizon, right? Major airline pilot, there's nothing in our manuals anymore that we aren't required to know um, know how anything works. In flight school, if we ask a question on how something works, they say, you don't need to know that. They, I, I talked to a lot of uh, big airline pilots, and they say when they were, you know, years and years ago, if you didn't know how to rebuild the plane, you weren't allowed to fly it. You had to know everything about it. Now you're not allowed to know anything about it. Here's another one. Um, at 100 miles away, um, they, they have to calculate the angle of descent. Right, but what they don't understand is that the the where they calculated from because it would be six thousand six hundred feet. That's over a mile below um, where they calculated from. But they don't calculate that drop of that Earth curve. They literally look at everything as a flat plane. Here's what you. This is hard for your mind to even conceive. This is the plane flying north to south. Right. So when it's right in the middle over the equator, there it's moving sideways at a thousand miles an hour. When it gets to the bottom of the top, it's pirouetting, and it's speeding up 1,000 down to zero, back up to 1,000, back down to zero, right? This is what you have to believe is happening, which is absolutely insane, and that's just the spin of the Earth. The Earth is also moving at 66,000 miles an hour and chasing the sun at a half a million miles an hour, but airplanes somehow can fly. Makes perfect sense to me. This is what you would see if you were flying at night, right? You're diving over the ball, and the stars in the distance would rise up. This is one of my favorite proofs because this one, you can't scream refraction. You can't scream anything other than, you know, this is what you would see 
um, as you dive over the ball. Because your position, you know, according to gravity, you know, you're always at the top. Um, this is what you would see. Absolutely. So here, you know, it's just another illustration. You're looking at those stars as the plane moves forward. Those stars are no longer in front of you. They're now above you. Um, it's my crude animation. And so this is a video of a plane going from Berlin to Brazil, right? 4,000 miles. They should be diving halfway around the globe. Um, and none of these stars are rising. They're just staying there. They just move on the turns, but they're not rising at all. This is what Google Earth says that same flight should look like. The stars should be rising, but they don't, right? This is another globe killer. Now, the Globers out there say, well, you know, you're going the direction with the stars that's canceling out. Well, then in the other direction, the stars should move twice as fast. And they filmed it in both directions, and they don't rise in either direction. And again, that claim is also fallacious. It doesn't work at all. So again, another globe killer. Oh. Oh, 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 are you back? Yeah, I'm here. How much did you lose? Okay, we lost you. We lost you for a while. How long was how long was that? Uh, thirty seconds. You were gone. All right. Well, that the I'll go back a little bit. Um, let's see. So I'm I'm back. I'm good. Yeah, all good. So, so from from uh from Berlin to Brazil, the stars are not processing upwards like they should because you're diving over the ball. You, the stars should be processing upward. This is what Google Earth says it should look like. This is what your common sense tells you it should look like because if you're diving over the ball, those stars should be rising, right? So a simulation from Google says this is what it should look like, but reality shows us something completely different where the stars do not rise. Now, the Glober said that, uh, that well, it's going. you're going in the direction of the spin and it's canceling each other out. Well, we're not going 1,000 miles now. We're going 500 miles an hour, so it would be slower. But the problem is heading in the other direction, if you want to count the spin, um, would make the stars move twice as fast, but they don't. That's like if you're driving on a highway next to a car um, going the same direction, you know, and you're going a little faster, that's fine. But if you're going the opposite direction, it would whiz by. And so we don't see it in either direction. The stars are always just staying there doing their east-west circle over the flat earth plane. Um, so that's a, that's a killer one right there. Satellites, what are satellites? We could do an hour just on that. But um, this is, again, from a pilot friend. We received a message that two NASA balloons are descending from 55,000 feet in our airspace, and they don't have transponders. This pilot, who's a flat earther, who knows that NASA has thousands of um, satellites up there with you know heavy you know, up to 8,000 pounds of satellite equipment on there. He was petrified. He's like, if we hit one of these, it'll take out the airplane. The other pilot who's a glober, he's like, oh, a balloon, that's fun. And he didn't, uh, you know, he didn't even care. So these things are, are um, up there. That If you didn't know, NASA has tens of thousands of satellites up there doing all sorts of stuff. Um, but there's all different ways that uh, you can put stuff in space. Um, and that's a whole nother show. Um, if you check my app in the Schooling the Globers on the on the uh, Schooling the Globers section, um, there is, uh, and that's on the homeschool page. Check out Austin's uh, Schooling Globers. He's got a whole section on what satellites can be. Absolutely amazing. But this is them just launching a satellite from Antarctica. Um, a lot, the new thing right now is people are like, what about uh, Starlink? Starlink, you know, uh, we're getting internet service uh, from Elon Musk. You know, this is Starlink. And made, maybe a bunch of you have seen it, if you guys ever have clear skies, but I've seen it. And it looks, they look really low and they're really um, very clear. And uh, it's very interesting. We heard some jet planes in front and behind them, which is interesting um, because they're supposed to be really high. So let's uh, think if these are Starlink satellites, could we see them? Well, here is a 747. Uh, it's a gigantic plane. And there's a 747 flying in the air. And uh, if the, the screen was a little bit bigger, you'd probably be able to see the plane, but you can't see the engines on the airplane. Because it's just too small. But you can see the outline of the airplane. That's cool, right? So that airplane's about seven miles high, right? The Starlink satellites um, are about three times the size of a human being. There's a human being right there. I'm pointing at You can barely see him, right? He's tiny next to that airplane. He's standing there right in front of the engine, okay? Three times the size. So you can, uh, you can, the Starlink is, the Starlink is three 140 miles up. Now, if the Starlink was seven miles up, you couldn't see it, but it's 340 miles up, and somehow it's clear as day with the and lit up, reflecting the sun perfectly. 
Those are a trick in the sky. Don't know what they are. They could be balloons. They could be drones. They could be a whole thing. Literally to make people believe that Starlink is a thing. If yeah, um, I got a whole presentation on it. It's uh, under the satellite section on the frequently asked questions page of the Flat Earth Clock app on how this uh, how satellite phones work. And what it is is satellite phones work using wandering cell towers. Imagine cell towers that can fly through the air, have a power source, can be serviced, and they know exactly where they are. And those are called airplanes. Jumbo jets have communication equipment on them, and they're literally just relaying, um, just like when you're driving down the road, you're moving from tower to tower to tower. Well, those planes are moving from and moving instead of you. It's the same thing. So they're just relaying the information. That's one of the ways that they work. And there's other things, too. There's other ways to put satellites in the air, but we don't have time to talk about that. 99% of all communications are done with undersea cables. Again, undersea cables prove flat earth because they all go up into the north to get to other southern locations. There's nothing from Santiago to Australia or even South Africa. They all go way up into the north and way down. You look at it on a flat earth map, um, you, it's undeniable. So this is um, a satellite map of the world. You have to believe that all those green dots are satellites that NASA is monitoring and all of those orange, those purple dots are garbage that NASA is monitoring, right? NASA monitoring all that. They can't even, you know, keep track of, you know, trillions of dollars and everything else, but somehow they're, they're monitoring all of that. What, meanwhile, those satellites are keeping their position, geostationary satellites and ones going around the earth um, while the earth is doing this. If you can't understand how that is the total impossibility, I may not be able to help you, but the earth is spinning, whirling and twirling, corkscrewing through space. And um, somehow all of these satellites are doing their little thing and NASA's keeping track of them. Um, you're completely brainwashed if you think that. And by the way, I was brainwashed. I believed all of that stuff, right? There's a real satellite balloon and there's a CGI a satellite um, going on. What about gravity? Gravity is a big one. The, um, yeah. So Walter Lewin from MIT says uh, it's electric forces that hold the world together, right? Very uh, esteemed professor. Um, come on. What is going on here? Changing. There we go. Did I go two? Um, good enough. So the in our flat earth, we live in this giant electrical toroid, and we live on the dielectric plane in the middle, right? There, 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 again, you can learn a ton of this stuff on the homeschool section of my app. Um, the sun and the moon are the anode and the cathode. The salt water carries the current. The land is the salt bridge. It's a giant electrical system. You know how batteries work? That makes perfect sense. Salt water does carry the current. Flat earthers are crazy because we think down is down for everybody on Earth. We think down is the same direction. Why Globers say, oh, no, no, people are standing antipodal to each other, and down is towards the center of a spinning ball flying through an infinitely po impossible space vacuum. Um, buoyancy and density sort everything else out. That airship is lighter than the air, so it floats. That ship is lighter than the water, so it floats on the water. And the submarine is heavier than the water, so it goes down and finds its neutral density. So how can we test um, how can we test electrostatics? Well, here we have some party balloons left over. We tied them onto this little button on the floor here, and we're adding a positive charge to it through that wire. And as we add that heavier positive charge, it goes down because the Earth has a negative charge to it, and positive and negatives attract attack attract each other. So here is we're putting a negative charge into this, and it goes up and it stays up. Are we defying gravity or are we defying electrostatics? That's, that's, the, that's the big question. So this is uh, from MIT. This is called the silent drone. No moving parts. It flies. What are they doing? They're just literally keeping it in a negative charge. They say it's the ionic wind that's going up, but you have to see this thing. It's amazing. It floats in the air on electrostatics. Is it defying gravity or is it defying something else? Right? And then also, in, uh, they have uh, Australia. They can guarantee you no rain for your special event. You have to pay a lot of money, but all they're doing is they're putting a negative charge into the cloud so they can't fall down. They're keeping it propelled above the earth. You know, again, what weather manipulation causes all sorts of stuff because the earth is always trying to catch up to where it's supposed to be. So there's something else I want to say about that. Um, oh, we'll talk about the law of large numbers. So um, those of you that know my, you know the answer to this, how long is one trillion seconds? Anybody that hasn't heard my presentation, know how long how long is one trillion seconds? You want to take a guess? Scream it Come out. On. Come on. 
15 years. Very, very close. One trillion seconds is 31,000 years, okay? That is to show you how big a trillion is, right? We're in trillions and trillions of dead here in the United States, right? 31,000 years is one trillion seconds. Hard to believe. Go verify that yourself. Don't believe me, right? 31,000 years. So a trillion is one with 12 zeros, right? So they tell us that the electrostatic force is 10 to the 36 times stronger than gravity. It's 10 with 36 zeros. That's what... That's what the number, that's how much stronger electrostatics is than, than gravity. That's what they tell us, right? Remember, a trillion is just that. Every time you add a zero, you are multiplying that exponentially, right? So if electrostatics were that strong, gravity is zero. Zero, 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 zero point zero with 36 zeros. There, there is no gravity. They're telling us that gravity isn't real, but just by admitting that electrostatics are that strong. Um, what is going on here? Here we go. Let's talk about tides. Um, well, well, tides prove it. The moon, the moon causes the tides. Well, if you look at a tide chart, um, I don't know what's going on here. Um, hold on a second. Why is it doing that? Well, it's showing a weird black thing. I got to fix that. But there's these tidal nodes around the earth and these high tides and low tides circle the tidal nodes. They have no correlation to where the moon is. However, when the moon is full, there is a higher tide. Right, the the moon is full. There's a higher tide. Interesting. So there's a higher tide on the side near the moon. There's two low tides on the top and bottom of the moon, and then there's a high tide on the far side of the Earth. Neil deGrasse Tyson um, says, "Well, the reason for that is the moon is pulling the water away from the Earth on the side where the moon is, and it's pulling the Earth away from the water. Okay, on the far side of the Earth. Am I allowed to say the word retarded? Because that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> All right." Right? It is the dumbest thing, the dumbest thing ever. But think about this. The, the sun has gravity. What's going on? My, my, oops. Okay, the sun has gravity. When the sun is on the far side of the earth, why doesn't the sun have a higher tide than the full moon? And what about when there's a new moon? The sun and the moon are on the same side of the earth. There should be a super high tide. You got the sun and the moon pulling on the tides. There should, but there's not. Right. Well, the moon's still there. It's just not lit up according to the heliocentric model. So the gravity from both of them is working. It's not. Um, it's not pulling. It's not doing any of that. What causes the tides? There is a correlation with the with the moon, and that's because the everything is electrostatics. The moon again is part of this energy system. When it's lit up, it's powered up, and it's causing some sort of attraction or repulsion um, of the of the salt water. No tides on fresh water. Only tides on salt water. Fascinating. Are all planets flat, right? So NASA shows us these uh, these nine new six new planets. Um, which one is not a real planet? Can any of you guess? Well, don't guess because they're all frying pans. Okay, they're all they're literally all burnt frying pans. But NASA stuff looks worse than that. Their their stuff just look at the what they show you. They're and they never say photograph. They don't have any photographs at all. So. When they say, well, are all planets round? Well, is that sun, moon? Is that spherical? What is that in the distance here? As it is it coming closer? It looks spherical. And when it gets closer, we realize it's a train. It's not even a circle. It's got rectangular lights. It's got orange lights. It's got blue lights. But we saw it as a yellow circle. And if someone told us it was a sphere, we'd have to believe it, unless, of course, it got closer like it just did. All right? If NASA showed us this, is this a NASA uh, depiction of another planet? You know, with the stuff, if you look at the stuff NASA shows us, um, this is actually believable. It actually looks better than some of the stuff they show us. But this is just a guy with a fisheye lens playing in his barn with a propane tank. Um, and, you know, <laughs> and, and NASA just shows us complete and total garbage. So here is NASA showing us, a, I think it was a Voyager or whatever um, fake craft they had. Going up to Jupiter. Now, this is over a couple hours, a couple days, whatever it was. And look at the storm spinning, the, the, the different directions that the storm, that everything's spinning, right? These are, you know, Jupiter is a gaseous planet made out of mostly hydrogen and helium, like 99%. And it has more gravity than all of the other planets combined. When gravity and helium, the hydrogen defy gravity here on Earth, but somehow it has more gravity, right? If we look at um, the, on the bottom picture on the right, that's the famous picture of Jupiter. 
2014, 2016, they said, oh, look, we filmed that uh, the Northern Lights, that proves it has a magnetic core, just like Earth. Mm -hmm. Wait, look at that. That is stupid. It is so dumb. Anybody could do that. Um, but if you look at the clouds, they're all exactly the same. It's just the one on top is a little darker, but every cloud is in the exact same position. So how did that happen? How did that happen? Um, that, I'll tell you how it happened. They're lying. They're faking. You know, and this is like a new picture of Jupiter. Very cool. Very cool. Very fake. Um, and that's just not me saying it's fake. Just look at it. <clears throat> NASA will never, ever say photograph. They say image and picture because they're not lying that way. On the top, these are um, what NASA shows us on the bottom. This is what the highest power zoom lenses show us. If you catch an ass lying once, um, it's over. You can, you can know they're lying about everything. Wow. This is a star zoomed in. Very interesting. Uh, it doesn't look like a burning ball of gas in a scientifically impossible space vacuum hundreds of trillions of miles away. This is um, the famous picture of Saturn. We took it off their website, put it in Photoshop, cranked up the levels, and you can see that it's sloppily pasted together um, horribly. And that there's no denying this. This is a cut and paste um, creation of a fake Saturn. So this, as they tell us, is a picture from Mars. This is uh, from the Curiosity rover, I believe, right? Is that Mars? Or did they just take out the blue sky of a desert area here on Earth? Or maybe it's the moon. Um, maybe they didn't tell us that, uh, that it's, it's, oh, come on. I have a little delay here. Is it the moon? Is it the moon? Is it Mars? Is it Earth? Right? Or maybe it's just a construction site in New Jersey. Right? Again, I did this without Photoshop in 10 seconds with their image. Don't tell me them with their $80 million every single day couldn't do the same. I even took some of images from, um, from Google Earth. from the, They have these mega pan pixel um, areas. And I took screenshots of them and I dropped them into Google Image Search. And Google identified them as Mars, coming from Mars. Okay. This is uh, this is the Curiosity rover taking a picture. I think it's a rover um, taking a picture of the of the of the helicopter. A helicopter that can fly in one percent atmosphere. When we can't fly a helicopter to the top of Mount Everest, which has a heck of a lot more atmosphere than one percent. Um, but if you look at the shadow and then the, where the circle is, where's the shadow from the camera? Right. What 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 is going on with the shadow there? Here's a, a worse one, it's directly from their website, you know, NASA.gov. The sun is where that arrow is on the horizon. And if you look underneath the big solar panels, the, pan the, the, the shadows are directly below it. How, how does that happen? Is there another sun? Right? Again, people just want to ignore stuff like this, um, but it's un undeniable. Here's one um, where we zoomed in on a picture, and what did we find? Life on Mars. Look, there's a fly. Life on Mars, right? Life on Mars, or maybe it just was taken here on Earth on Devon Island. Um, you know, who knows, right? Scaling and variance. Scaling and variance. They tell us that the sun is 400 times bigger uh, than the moon and uh, 400 times farther. Therefore, you know, they look like they're the same size. Um, that's called scaling and variance. When you make something, you know, twice as big, twice as far, it looks like it's the same size. That's actually something true. So the sun is one astronomical unit, 93 million miles. It's eight light minutes. So two, two AUs away, four, eight. Um, and, and so, so eight, eight, like eight AUs is one hour. Eight times eight is 64. We'll round down to an hour and then two light hours. And I can't move there. Um, four light hours. You can barely see it. It's the size of a star, right? So if the sun was four light hours away, you arguably couldn't see it, but let's let's be let's be safe. Let's make it let's make it come on. Let's make it two hundred times farther just to be safe. Two hundred times farther. It is scientifically provable. You could not see the sun because its angular size would be too small. And the 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 inverse square law of light is a whole nother argument, but we don't even need it because you can't see it. So no need no worries about that. So if uh, 200 times farther is 33 days, we'll call it one light month. So at one light month, you could not see the sun. What can we do with that information? They tell us Polaris, our North Star that we can all see, is 46 times bigger than the sun, right? So if we made it 46 times farther, then it will appear to be the same size. So 
46 times one light month is 46 months, rounding off four light years. At four light years away, Polaris is multiple, multiple, multiple times too far for us to be able to see it because its angular size is too small, All right? So at four light years, we can't see it um, for, for several reasons, right? So um, how far away do they tell us Polaris is? Remember, four light years is way too far to see it. And how far do they tell us Polaris is? If my screen will change, come on. Hold on, there we go. 433 light years, okay? So that's 429 light years farther than we already can't see it and we can see it. Again, if you can't see this problem, I can't help you, right? <laughs> Star rotation, that's another big argument. You know, Glovers love looking at the lights in the sky that are scientifically impossible, burning balls of gas in a, in a space vacuum, and claiming that proves the shape of the Earth, right? When we look up at the sky, I think the sky is water. Well, when we put water in front of some circling stars, they kind of change directions. So all bets are off when we're looking into the sky um, because of all sorts of anomalies that we would see in the sky. I don't... I have many theories, again, on my app, the Flat Earth, Sun, Moon, and Zodiac Clock app, on the FAQ page, there's a there's a list of Southern Star rotation videos, lots of content there, lots of stuff that YouTube's hiding from you. They tell us, you know, one of the big debunking videos out there is uh, people from, uh, you know, from South America, South Africa, and Australia can all see um, the Southern Cross at the same time. Well, that's not true. Because one, when it's midnight in, in uh, South America, it's 12 noon in Australia. There's only 20 minutes of one day every year where people on the very edges of those two continents and, um, and you know, and, and, uh, South, and South Africa can see it at the same time. 20 minutes. But the thing is, think about the person over in South America. They're looking down over the ball at it. And the people over in Australia are supposed to looking down over the ball. One of them should see it upside down to the other, but no one sees it upside down to the other to the other person. It's just tilted a little bit from their point of view. So the whole thing is a bunch of nonsense. This is what this is what is going on. You know, a time lapse of the stars. This is what we see, but they want us to believe this is going on. They want us to believe this is going on. Look at that body of water. Think about that spinning. Speeding up, slowing down, changing its linear path, right? Perfectly calm. They want us to believe that, right? Photos of the Earth is another big argument. Um, we were all brainwashed when the first iPhone came out. This is the blue marble. It was on everyone's phone. But if you, and most of you have seen this, but if you zoom in on the clouds, you can see that they're Photoshopped. And uh, it's a bunch of nonsense. Because even if you look at all the balloon shots, 120,000 feet, there's no color you can't see greens and yellows. You can't see a blue because it all washes out because you're looking through so much atmosphere. It's all white, right? But they want you to believe you can see this from space. Um, you know, and people, what about the ISS? Look at that. This is the top pictures from the ISS. That entire area is in that little red circle. Can you guys see the little red circle? That entire part of the earth is that little red circle. Now just wrap the rest of it around the, uh, the globe that size. Makes no sense. That is a fisheye lens from a high altitude Airplane might, have, might not even be that high. This is the 2002 blue marble. Uh, the next picture of Earth that it gave us. Look, the United States is mighty big, mighty big, right? But if we look at a world map and we drop that down there, the rest of those continents are on the other side of, the, of that ball. That's what it would have to be if you believe that shot is real. Again, if you can't see that, I can't help you. Um, but here's something we can measure. I'm in Mexico. We can measure across Mexico. We go to Baja, and we can say that's 934 miles. We could actually physically measure that. 934 miles. NASA tells us the, the diameter of the Earth is 7,917 miles. So that little orange, the little red segment I have across, um, across Mexico, I should fit eight and a half of those in between those two red lines. Eight and a half. Something's wrong. You know what's wrong? This is a painting. Right. I remember when we saw this picture in uh, 20 um, in 19 in 1978 and 2017. They're like, oh, global warming, uh, you know, global pollution, global dimming. That was big global dimming. Amazing. And um, look at it. This is, this is what they showed us. Look at the clouds. None of them have changed. Right. None of them have changed. It's the same clouds. 
They're either lazy or rubbing it in our face. It's it's unreal. People say, well, we didn't have Photoshop. Uh, we did. We actually found articles in 1963. They were able to insert people into videos without any way to detect it. So Photoshop is uh, far less technology than that. Which is easier to paint? The photograph on the left or the photograph on the right? Well, the truth is they're both paintings. Both of those are paintings, right? The one on the right is pretty damn easy next to the one on the left. That's done without Photoshop. Um, here's the biggest storm ever filmed by the ISS. So cool. <clears throat> so cool, right? That storm is 400 miles wide. 400 miles wide. Wait a minute. 400 miles wide. Put that on a ball. That's 400 miles, right? Let's pop a, a, another picture NASA gave us of the United States. United States is like 300 miles wide, okay? Again, they can't get any of these proportions right. It's all a bunch of nonsense, and people just fall for it. It's uh, it's actually shocking. Um, what's going on here? Um, let's talk about eclipses. Eclipses is another one. You can't predict eclipses. Eclipses have been predicted long before the globe was ever even thought of. Uh, the antikythera mechanism, 2,000 years old, another discovery hidden from us. Um, is uh, shows you every eclipse, when it's going to happen, where it's going to happen. And the eclipses come in perfect cycles. Let's talk about a lunar eclipse. That's when the, supposedly the Earth gets in between the sun and the moon and causes a shadow on the moon. You know, they're like, well, only a sphere could do this. Um, why is my image changing? Here we go. So only a sphere could do this. So as the Earth moves up, it casts a shadow on the moon. Um, I defy anyone to cast a shadow a hundred yards, let alone a quarter of a million miles and have a nice defined edge like that. Um, so this is what it, what it looks like, but there's been over 50 documented Sela Nilian eclipses. That's what I'm showing you right here. The eclipse starts before the sun and the moon set on the, the viewer who's on the top. Um, you can see the sun and the moon above the horizon, proving that it's not below the ball. And the eclipse, the last one came in from the top. Um, Wrap your mind around that. It's an impossible eclipse. As a matter of fact, scientists have a second name for it because if you can't pronounce Selenillion, um, you can pronounce the impossible eclipse because that's what they call it. They're like, well, you know, it's impossible, but yeah, we guess we just don't understand it. Um, yeah, you don't understand it because we don't live on a ball. They call it the impossible eclipse. Um, solar eclipses is, is supposedly when the moon gets in between the sun and the earth and we see it blocking out the sun. Do you see the moon here? Now, sorry for the low resolution. Do you see the the sun? The, I mean, the moon there? Do you see the moon? I just see missing sky. I see missing sky. There's no sign of the moon. There's just a missing chunk of the sun. I took this one myself, right? There's no moon visible um, from from anywhere. Um, there, there's, there's no moon visible. So um, on the eclipses section on the Frequently Asked Questions page of the app, I have some uh, videos called the rear the projected sun i i i highly recommend you watch those videos and then you understand how this happens um in my opinion all right um and because i've modeled it and it works it looks exactly like it uh, and if someone needs to prove me wrong before i'll change my mind um and i'm willing to change my mind because i have i used to think we live on a globe flying through a space vacuum uh day and night okay if the earth was a globe then only 50 percent of the of 50% will be in the light at all times. Think about it. You got a single source light. You got a sphere. No matter how you spin it, turn it, twilt, tilt it, no matter what, only half of it will be lit and half of it will be in the dark. But um, there's many times of the year, there's many times um, where the earth is more than 50% lit. On July 8th, every year, 99% of the world's population, a lot of, lot of flat earthers go 99% of the earth. It's not. It's the world's, earth's population. Most of us live in the north. And it's like 72% or let's just say 70% of the earth is lit at the same time. That is impossible. 70% of the earth is in light. That doesn't work on a ball. But if you take the light pattern on a flat earth and wrap it around a sphere, it could happen. Right? Here's, an, here's a, uh, come on. Why does that change? Here's a photo from NASA uh, showing this. This is impossible. This is an impossible lighting situation on a ball. It can not work. That, look at that line. You can see that about 70% is in the dark and the rest is in light. It does not work. Um, and there's a blank slide I got to remove. So here is me just playing with a light outside of a glass dome. 
And as I move it forward and back, you can watch how that light wraps around, comparing it to the light patterns uh, back and forth on the flat Earth map. When the sun goes out to the out to the Tropic of Capricorn in December, the light wraps around and causes some daylight on the far side. That's how we get daylight in Antarctica all the way around. We don't have a 24 hour sun, but we have 24 hours of daylight. And it's just kind of coincidental that when I move it on a on a um, on a glass dome, it works. As, it, it gives us the same thing. Southern flight routes, another fun killer for mine. This is a World Cup. They are done in Doha. They went to Rome for fuel, and then they went to Buenos Aires. That's weird. Okay, why did they go straight there? It seems like it's the same distance. Seems way out of the way. But if you look on the right, uh, Rome is right on their flight path where they can fuel up before they fly over that large span of ocean. Rio to Sydney stops in Los Angeles. Kind of weird. Look at it on a flat Earth map. Makes perfect sense. Why don't they just fly across where those question marks are? If we look at Buenos Aires to New Delhi, stops in Amsterdam. Kind of silly. Makes perfect sense on a flat Earth map. If we look at um, Sydney to Lima, Peru, um, and there's plenty of people that want to go from Sydney to Lima, Peru direct. They don't have to pick up other passengers, change pilots, or anything like that. This is the Qantas flight. Why are they stopping in California? Why don't they just fly across the, where the question marks are? It's a much shorter trip. Um, they fly there because it's a straight line on a flat Earth map. Um, South Africa to Sydney stops in Dubai. Look at that on the globe. Ridiculous. Looking at a flat Earth, it's a perfectly straight line. Makes perfect sense. Um, this is from South Africa to Australia. Uh, the three different flights, one stops in Dubai, Hong Kong, and Malaysia. And if we look at it on a flat Earth map, uh, it makes a lot more sense uh, going there. You know, And maybe those are picking up more passengers. Maybe they're just different stops. But uh, that's the most direct that you can get. Here is um, New Zealand to Argentina, right? That line right there would be the best. But um, it goes all the way up. Uh, San Francisco, Houston, Texas, and then Argentina. That is way out of the way. Look at it on a flat earth map. Look at that. It's a straight line. Uh-oh. My lights just went out. Why did that go out? Um, hold on. Everyone's here. It's good here. Yeah. Still. Um, my power strip went out. Um, You? I don't know. Everything's out. Oh, everything's out, but somehow one light is still on and I'm still online. So we're going to go. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. That that can only happen on a flat earth. Um, <laughs> so, so people say, Yo, well, the times, well, they don't know that there's counter rotating winds at different altitudes um, that, that, that airplanes use, you know, they, they know where these are. NASA, um, launches over it's a 2,000 balloons every single day to monitor the weather from all over the Earth. I think it's 900 and some odd locations, twice a day at the exact same time, launch weather balloons. And all of this is put into a computer. The airplanes know exactly where to fly, and they make perfect sense. We found um, uh, articles, uh, you know, official documents, talking about 350-mile-an-hour winds um, at 40,000 feet. 350-mile-an-hour tailwind. That'll get you somewhere uh, pretty darn quick. Um, emergency landings are, are some of my favorite. Sometimes people have to land uh, because of an emergency. You know, sometimes people um, die suddenly. We'll just say that for YouTube. And uh, so here's a flight from, from Hong Kong um, to, it was actually going to the UK, but it, had, it stopped in Germany. It's a 12-hour flight. A mother died in her seat. Died suddenly, uh, kids, father, all sitting next to her, and they should have just landed the plane, um, but they didn't. They flew for eight more hours, right? Four hours into the flight, died suddenly, flew for eight more hours. Why didn't they stop? There's a whole bunch of places to stop. The reason is because eight, four hours into the flight, they were over Russia. And if they stopped, two things would happen. One, Russia would have been very helpful. That could spark peace. We can't have that. And the other thing is people would say, like me and Ian, would be like, why did you stop over Russia? Look, flat earth map. So they can't even admit that they were over Russia, right? They can't even admit it. So they flew. They stopped in Germany. I'm like, at that point, those kids are damaged for life. Why don't you just fly the other hour and get them to London, get them home? So here is an emergency landing from um, 
Chicago to Doha, emergency stops in Moscow. That's like 1,500 miles out of the way. They got there in a ridiculous amount of short amount of time, an impossible short amount of time. And um, they uh, stopped in Moscow, look on the flat earth map. It makes perfect sense. Moscow is right on that line. There's uh, the book, 16 Emergency Landings, right here um, that I highly recommend people get. You can find it on my website. Um, actually, I mean, I'm jumping the gun here. There it is on my website, 16 Emergency Landings. Uh, it's great. Also, um, lots of other great stuff um, on my website, flatearthdave.com. Meteors and asteroids, that's always a big one. Um, listen to this. Earth. 43,000 miles an hour. Does that look like it's going 43,000 miles an hour? The ISS is going 17,000 miles. A rifle bullet goes 1,700 miles an hour. That's going 43,000 miles an hour. And is it coming straight down? That is some sort of weapon that was fired to make us think it's an asteroid. They're always coming at these ridiculous angles. And when we look at it, they're like, oh, look at this, our meteor impacts. Well, those would have to hit at a 90 degree angle to the earth. We've never seen that. But if you compare them to geysers, meteor craters on the top, geysers on the bottom, right? Meteor craters, geysers. These are just the earth bubbling up. And also we go through all these meteor showers every year, same time, every year, same days, really weird. Um, and we've only seen meteors go down. No one's ever seen them go up. But if you look at this, the people on the top of the globe are seeing uh, meteors go down. Well, now I switched it. Now the people on the bottom are seeing them go down and we're seeing them go up, right? Because if they're coming in one way, someone you know, on one side of the world is going to see it up and the other one's going to see it down, but no one's ever seen a meteor go up. They all go down. They all go down. Stupid. <laughs> uh, NASA, again, they're, you know, snake tongue, evil NASA, founders of NASA, um, founder of Scientology, cartoon producer, Nazi, occultist, and, uh, you know, Aleister Crowley. That, that's a nice group of people. I'd love to start, start something for me. That'd be great. Um, so, Elon, um, what's, um, what's his name? The, Ian, help me out here. The guy that was... Brown. 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 So, his gravestone says, Psalms 19, 1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament show with his handiwork. What is that? Why are they doing that? Is that a deathbed confession? Is that just poking us in the eye? Is that revelation of the method? Um, or, or are they just having a good laugh? I, I couldn't tell you because uh, I'm not involved. But Werner von Braun wrote a book in 1957, I think, um, about a, a rocket that went to Mars, took a bunch of people to Mars to start a colony. And the guy's name that led the colony was Elon. And that's Elon's rocket on the left that's supposedly going to go to Mars. Right? And Elon, in one tweet a last couple of years ago or last year, said, um, I want to make my rocket pointier, right? And th that's just, an, again, another poke at us. You know, science fiction becoming science fact. Here is um, Elon's rocket that's going to go to Mars, a test flight. I'm going to show this. It's a minute and a half. I don't have a minute and a half for my other presentation, but here I have it. So you have to believe that that little flame is pushing up this, you know, multi-ton rocket. Now, use your common sense. How far, how high is this rocket? Look, we're looking at the side of it. It can't be that high. Oh, it's pretty high now from the onboard camera. Now look at the rocket. Look at the speed. Look at the smoke. Is it really? Oh, it's very high again. That's interesting. Now look. Now it's going down. Look at the smoke. How fast is it moving? Now watch the edit. The smoke will change speeds. Watch. Okay. Ready? Now look at it. This thing is multiple tons falling out of the sky. Is it? You know, oh, wow, now it's this high. None of this is out of sequence. This is directly from their live stream. Now watch this thing. It's falling down. It looks kind of like the Thunderbirds. The engines are going to turn on. It's magically going to stand up. Two of the three engines are going to burn out, and it's going to land upright perfectly. Ready? Oh, power's back on. Um, and watch. One, two, three engines. It's a little firework. Cameraman gets right under it somehow. Well, now watch. Two of the engines are going to burn out. Two of the engines are going to burn out, and it's going to land upright. <laughs> With a bunch of CGI smoke. Okay. And it's a little, like if you ask me, they love their phallic symbols. Um, if you can't see what's wrong with that, I can't help you. All right now, watch these guys. This is what this is one of the test ones that crashed. Everyone's watching. Watch these people's reaction. Watch their reaction. 
Nothing. Nothing. Everybody would have gone, oh, my God. Oh, my God. They would have jumped. Look at this guy right here. Nothing. Nothing. (laughs) Bull loney. Okay. This is the NASA live stream. Now, watch this. The Earth looks pretty flat to me, but um, let's not even look at that. Look at this strap. What's going on there? This is just showing you that using multiple layers, layers and layers, doing all sorts of trickery. And um, if we if we let this play a little bit, the same thing happens with the guy's foot. Uh, if we watch, um, I'll let this go a little longer because I, I do have extra time here. Um, so in a second, you'll see his foot um go g- kind of get cut off the same way give it a second here so th- people use this as proof that we're flying in a machine 17,000 miles an hour above the earth now watch carefully watch his foot in a moment when it comes close to you right there look there's a layer there okay again watch it again i'll zoom in on it i think there, there's a layer. So again, we caught the, there, right there. See it? So we, we caught them. Caught, done. Everything's fake. NASA's full of it. It's a bunch of nonsense. This is one of my favorites. Um, they got a fresh lemon on the spaceship and they were playing with it. They went to grab it. Now this shows you that this is called augmented reality where they're playing with non, not real CGI objects. Watch the hand. It goes right through it. Okay. This is fake. Everything's fake. You don't need the fake anti-gravity on the space station if, um, if it's real. But again, we catch them all the time. This one here, one of my favorites, this balloon ball is real. It's filled with helium. It's at that perfect neutral buoyancy. That up there is not real. Okay? Look at it. Watch again. It's not there, and they even beam it in with a sound and a little Star Trek beaming thing. Wasn't there, right? Go forward and backwards here, right? So this is just showing you that they're how the level of fakery that they have. There's no need to do that. No need to do that whatsoever. Oops. Um, This is, uh, you know, in 1999, they were celebrating Christmas up there with the gravity on. And then in 2023, the gravity's off. Look at the hats, okay? Yes, they didn't. Or they're just poking us in the eye again. Um, The space... Shuttle weighs over 4 million pounds, but it blows around in the wind like a bouncy house. Because if you ask me, it is a bouncy house. On the app, on the web button, more resources page, there's a section called Rockets Are Balloons. Take that and watch it. Um, If you're a glober and you love space, bring a box of tissues because you're not going to be happy, right? (laughs) Here is the space shuttle. Um, these, they want you to believe that these people are right there. They're 12 or more miles away. They can't even see the thing until something goes up in the air. They can't see anything, right? Now, look at the thrust coming out here. Superheated thrust over 20,000 miles an hour. That fence, nothing. That fence, nothing. That would destroy everything. We know what a hurricane does at 250 mile an hour wind. 200 miles an hour winds turn, you know, just turn metal poles into pretzels, right? But somehow this thing goes off. Now, look at this. The solid rocket boosters detached, and if you listened, at the second they detached, you heard them. Well, that thing's 30 miles down street, downwind, or uh, down, down, down range. You wouldn't hear it for 90 seconds. So you see it, and then 90 seconds later, you'd hear it. You'd hear it. We hear it at the same time. The other thing is, it's going, you know, 17,000 miles an hour, or maybe faster. And somehow, those things still in the atmosphere can fly sideways. This is all. This is all complete and total trickery. Um, you know, the SR seventy one can go two hundred. Uh, you know, Mach three point two. Um, but the space and any faster than that, it rips apart, right? And that thing can't even have paint on it because it gets so hot. But that hunk of junk garbage can with the big balloon on it that can go Mach thirty three, right? And it's got like PVC on the side of it, non aerodynamic parts. Absolute and total nonsense. Um, this is what we really see. The top one is what they want us to believe we see. Um, again, all, all complete and total nonsense, all rockets. Whenever they're shooting something up, there's nobody ever on them. They're probably miniatures. Most of them are just balloons. And, um, 
They crash him into the Bermuda Triangle. Here is the moon. Then they took off off the moon. Watch this shadow. <clears throat> Excuse me. Watch this shadow of the moon lander. What you're gonna see it right over here, right? As you go up, a shadow doesn't do that. It disperses. We have a perfectly crisp shadow. It doesn't work. Absolute and total nonsense. Again, you know, I say realize, realize, real lies. Um, before I was telling you about the anti cathera mechanism on the app, on the, um, you can just search for um, the mechanical realm or check on the, the Flat Earth movies list. A movie worth watching. This is about the anti cathera mechanism will blow your mind. Um, and they, this is a working flat earth model. Um, people think that a cult leader looks like this. That's uh, for those of you who don't know, that's um, I don't know, it's on his name. It's a, uh, oh, thank you. I'm, I'm having a brain fart. Um, but this is what a cult leader really looks like. Um, and, and Neil deGrasse Tyson is that cult leader here in America, at least. I don't know. You guys have Brian Cox. I call him lying box. Um, why the lie is, uh, is my favorite section on the app on the frequently asked questions page. Um, you know, one of the reasons is, uh, if you look at it, all of the music industry, um, in the world is, uh, everything that's, you know, iTunes and album sales and concerts and everything is 19 billion, um, Home, uh, movies and entertainment, um, a hundred and I can't see it, 130 billion. Is that what it says? Um, yeah. Video games, um, 137 billion. Add those together. It's not even nearly as much as the space industry. So that's one that's money. Um, I don't actually think that's the biggest one, but you want a motivation for people that believe that money's real. That's, that's one, right? Divine law is the law of God. <laughs> Common law is the law of the land. Statute law and admiral time mar mar maritime law is the law of the sea or man's law. In order to convince man to give up his divine rights and their common rights, you have to convince them that they're not divinely created in a divine world. That's a good reason. Um, if, uh, if you play on their game, on their game board, if you play their game on their game board, you consent to play by their rules. He who owns it, he who creates it owns it. So if you want to play on their ball with their money, you have to play by their rules, but their ball is a prison for your mind. They don't want you to know that there's more land that there's, uh, you know, more resources, you know, the, the big, all the wars in the world are fought over resources and land. And if, uh, you know, if you want a motivation, what if there's more lands? What if there's hundreds of more continents out there? Um, you know, as George Carlin said, they own you, but what if there's, there's more, more continents out there, um, that they're keeping, they, they take all the benefit from other civilizations, other resources. Uh, that is a hell of a reason to lie about it. So what has flat earth done for anyone's um, for anyone's well-being. Well, uh, we are more, we, flat earthers are more at peace, um, greater sense of freedom, and a closer connection to the creator. Those, those are just some of the, some of the things. And, um, you know, if you ask me, um, the whole land, the more land, uh, I'm buying it. it there, you know, we should be able to, to, to go out and, and explore. Mm -hmm. and you're not like can you guys hear that no it's a bit bad dave all right well, that's coming through my microphone i thought uh, for some reason i didn't share what's on so basically they cut it out they wrapped it around a ball it's a prison for your mind and it's limiting you from the from the real truth so that's the end of my presentation. There's a um, that barely scratched the surface of flat earth. You know, the globe is like to say no flat earth proofs. There's only flat earth proofs. There's no globe proofs. And again, my app, the flat earth sun, moon and zodiac clock app. Um, I made it so people can have access to everything that they're hiding. My video search breaks their algorithm. Um, when you, when you watch a video, the next video served up is served up by the app, not by Google. And, um, what else? Um, that I guess that's it. I think that's very well done, David. Ladies and gentlemen, got some information there. Thank you.